So um, without further ado, Thea Chesney. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you all for coming out to hear a talk about mushrooms to a plant group. This is great. I normally am talking to people who have come specifically for content. I'm sure many of you have tonight as well. Um, but yeah, this is what I do in my off time. I am a seasonal botanist for the Forest Service, and, and that's what I do all summer long. But I am always, always, always looking for mushrooms and wondering about what they're doing in our ecosystems. And just, I think they're really cool organisms. I hope to be able to share that with you. And get a little bit technical. I hope not to overwhelm you. But I'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. And um, get started. So this, this little <laughs> beautiful pink mushroom is a mycorrhizal mushroom with mountain hemlock. And those are hemlock needles in the shot. And it's further even more specific than that because it only grows around melting snow. And in the western mountains, in the Rockies, and the Sierra Nevadas, and the Cascades, we have a unique suite of fungi that only come up as the snow is melting. Other mountain ranges in the world don't really show the same kind of mushrooms. So this is pretty unique. And this is a beautiful pink waxy cat. So, let's continue. Here's the site where I was for work just a few weeks back. And this is pretty rocky, pretty barren soil. Yet there are these red firs. This is almost all Shasta red fir here. And there are the, this is carpet of buckwheat, there's carpet of lupins. Um, a lot of life happening there. And what does this have to do with fungi? Of everything that you can see in this picture is dependent upon this underground network. The plant roots, the fungi that are partners with the plant roots, and many, many other parts, many other organisms, which I won't even have a chance to cover tonight. So it's really a complicated system, um, and one that research is still ongoing, and we are still trying to figure out what is exactly going on. So I'll try to give a kind of state of what we know. So the basic term mycorrhiza, from the Greek, all it is is fungus root. Just refers to a fungus that's living in association with the root of a plant. And the structure of fungi, which is almost the entire organism, and a part which we can never see with our naked eye, is the hyphae. These are long, single cell thick strands of fungal tissue. Their cells are very elongate and they're usually in the soil. They can grow, other types of, types of fungi can grow through organic matter. But this is the, the business end, as we say. If you have seen mushrooms, that is not the organism. Those are not the fungi. Those are just the reproductive structures. And so that's a tiny, tiny part, a very showy part a tiny, tiny part of what's going on down there. So now I start to get a little bit technical. Um, there are several different types of mycorrhizal associations. These happen in different plant families, and almost all plant families, in fact, have some type of mycorrhizal association. Um, there are, we'll get, I'll kind of go through the different types. But a lot of what I have here is micro, uh, microscopic photographs. And that's in a lot of cases because we can't see anything with our naked eyes. This first group are vascular mycorrhizae. You may have also heard it as vesicular or vascular mycorrhizae in other texts, or endomycorrhizae. These are, this is formed by a group of fungi, the glomeromycota, which never produce any macroscopic fruiting body. In fact, a lot of times they don't even produce a fruiting body at all. They just reproduce asexually. So it's a very kind of weird system to those of us who are used to thinking about plants which reproduce in the open, animals which reproduce, you know, sexually and we can see and understand what's happening. These fungi are weird. <laughs> They're really weird. So 
what you're seeing here is actually um, from the root of an erythronium, fawn lily. And it has got all this fungal tissue within the cells of the root. These are, I think, the cortical cells, the cortex of the root. So these fungal hyphae have actually gone through the cell wall. They have not gone through the cell membrane. They don't actually penetrate the membrane, but they push it in into all these weird, fanciful shapes which we call arbuscules, because they are often kind of tree-like, as you can see in the, the top image. So that, all this stain tissue is fungal tissue, and it's, you're looking inside of a plant cell. So that is a lot of surface area that is exchanged, you know, for exchange between the fungal hyphae and the plant cell membrane. And what are they exchanging? They're exchanging, oh. Top one. Ah, yes. <laughs> Fungal hyphae, the tree shape, inside a plant cell. Good. <laughs> yeah, so their main function, their main purpose is gathering nutrients and water that plant roots would otherwise have a really, really hard time getting. So remember that I said that the business end, the structure of fungi, is, are these single celled filaments of hyphae. That is a much, much smaller diameter than any plant root or root hair. It's really incredibly thin. So these fungal hyphae can get into spaces in the soil that plant roots can't get to. They are also relatively cheap for the fungus to build, and so they can easily cover much larger areas than plant roots can. So you may have heard you know, how amazing plants are, and they are absolutely incredible. They do one thing really well. They photosynthesize. They can make their own food. There are a couple of other microscopic groups of organisms that can do that, but nothing else that's really macroscopic that we can see can do that. But plants can't do a lot of other things on their own. They really need partners. And the First thing that we know that fungi gather for plants is phosphorus. One of the absolutely key nutrients for plants to survive and to grow. Uh, plant roots very, very quickly deplete any available phosphorus in the soil that's right around the root. So having this fungal structure that extends way beyond the root allows them to access a whole bunch of other resources, resources that are further away. And that has a lot to do with plant survival in barren rocky soils like that, where the, a lot of the nutrients are locked up in rocks. So we know now that many fungi can produce organic acids. They can secrete those from their hyphae, and they're actually weathering down the rocks. If you've ever seen a little pine tree growing out of a split rock, it absolutely has fungal hyphae that are extending into the rock as far as they can, which isn't very far, but breaking that down and providing those nutrients to the tree. So this is really, really just the common type of mycorrhizae in almost all plant families it occurs. And it is incredibly ancient. There are fossils from the Rhiney Chert, the early Devonian, which show structures that are almost identical to these in fossilized plant root cells. We don't know exactly what their function was at that time, if they were parasites on the plants, or if they were just living kind of free and associating with the plants maybe a little bit. It's not really clear, but that hasn't changed much in 400 million years, that structure. So now we'll go on to the next slide. This is maybe more familiar to many of you, certainly more familiar to me. Ectomycorrhizae are a much more recent innovation in terms of fungi and plants. They arose about around about the same time as the major angiosperm radiation. So that's a much more recent thing. Of course, they are not only with angiosperms, they are with several gymnosperm families as well. But it's a different kind of system than the arbuscular mycorrhizae. So up here you can see, this is a 
cross section of a plant root. And those cells, those plant cells are clear. There are no fungal hyphae growing in the plant cells. What the fungal hyphae is doing is it's forming a nice outer ring, that's the mantle, that's covering the root surface. And then it's forming this network that's going between the root cells. So that, we call that the Hartig net. And that is the net that, network that extends into the root, but not into the actual cells. And this you can actually see, unlike our vascular mycorrhizae, which you can not really see on the outside of the root, you can see this with your naked eye or with a hand lens. That's magnified about maybe 20 times. Um, you aren't seeing any of the root tissue there. That, that golden mantle is all fungal hyphae. It's completely wrapped around the outside of the root. So that's what you're seeing in the Pinaceae. Your pines, your dug firs, all of those pinaceous conifers. Not, let me said, the Cupressaceae. Not our cypress, not our juniper, not our redwoods, not our sequoias. Those all have our vascular mycorrhizae. These tiny, tiny little microscopic things that somehow manage to make these gigantic trees thrive. But yeah, Pinaceae, the Phagaceae, all of our oaks have the echomycorrhizae. Uh, some things in the rose family in the southern hemisphere, the dipterocarps have it, and eucalyptus also uh, is echomycorrhizal. So it's this much more scattered thing. It's not nearly as common as our vascular mycorrhizae, but it is absolutely key to our forest ecosystems. All right, let's see. I'm going to keep talking about different types of mycorrhizae. Ericoid mycorrhizae, limited to the Ericaceae, but not even all of the Ericaceae. It is on cranberries, it's on rhododendrons, um, heathers, different bog heathers. Is not on madrone or manzanita. Madrones and manzanitas have a different system, which I'll talk about in a minute. And also, all of our non chlorophyll containing parasitic members of the Ericaceae also have a different system. But the Ericoid mycorrhizae is a lot like our vascular mycorrhizae, so if you don't see the distinct tree structures, it's more just that the fungal hyphae are all coiled up through the outer cells of the root. It's really can be quite densely packed. So go on to the next. The Arbutoid mycorrhizae is even more specific, perhaps. That is limited to the subfamily Arbutoidae of the Ericaceae, which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> the Ericaceae has got it going on when it comes to mycorrhizae, that's for sure. But it's almost like an ectomycorrhizae bone relationship. It's got a mantle, that's all fungal tissue around the outside of that root cross section. And it's got a hardtick net that extends a little bit in the outer root cells there. But those fungal hyphae also grow into the outer cells. So it's kind of like a little bit of both, both the arbuscular and the ecto strategies that are going on here. And it seems to work well for Manzanita, it seems to work well for Madrone. And what's interesting is that these plants work with the same ectomycorrhizal partners that other trees do. So they have a lot of shared fungal partnerships. And it, it is actually very common for one fungus to have multiple tree partners, and certainly for one tree to have multiple fungal partners. And it's usually restricted to one kind of mycorrhizae, so ectomycorrhizae or our vascular mycorrhizae. But yeah, these Arbutus and Arctosaphilos um, have them a little bit differently, but still basically function like vascular mycorrhizae. <coughs> and then I'll get into talking about orchids a little bit before I start talking about parasites, which are in both the Ericaceae and the orchid family. So orchids are incredibly dependent on fungal partners, more so than any other group of plants that I can think of. A lot of orchids, in fact, it's been shown in almost all species, they need to have their fungal partners in place before their seeds can germinate. So they need to be able to get some sort of chemical signal, we aren't exactly sure what it is, from the fungal hyphae before their seeds can even germinate. 
And most orchids get their nutrition from their fungal partners when they're young, as their seeds are germinating, as they're growing. But then once they're mature, they are producing enough, enough sugars by photosynthesis to make it kind of an equal partnership. So we're talking about all mycorrhizal types, saying that the fung fungi are giving nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, and other mineral nutrients, and water to the plants. The plants are providing photosynthates in return, they're providing sugar. And so the plant, the fungus doesn't have to find some other way of getting its main nutrition. It doesn't have to decompose anything. It doesn't have to, yeah, find another way to make its own food. But in the case of the orchids, the fungus does have to be able to provide food to the orchid before the orchid can provide food to the fungus. So <laughs> it's a little bit different strategy. And the orchid mycorrhizae are again using the same ectomycorrhizal fungi as other plants. And this is really important for them because they can't provide the nutrition to the fungi early on in that cycle, early on in their life. So they're basically needing a fungal partner to germinate. And then as they're starting to grow roots, it's again, kind of like in our vascular mycorrhizae situation, all the dark cells are filled with fungal tissue there. Um, but that fungus has to have another partner that's providing the sugars to the entire system. So this is a form of what we call microheterotrophy, and that just refers to feeding on fungi to get your nutrition. And that's important in the context of plants because what did I say plants can do really well most of the time? They photosynthesize. They can make their own food that's unique. But not all plants do, or not all plants do at certain parts of their lifetime. So plants that get their nutrition from fungi and thereby from the fungi's other plant partners are megahydrotrophs. They're pretty cool. A little bit more about that. You might know this one. Snow plant, Sarcodes sanguinea, it's one of our most recognizable springtime flowers in the Sierra Nevadas. That's the whole plant. I mean, it's got roots, but that's what you see. It doesn't have any chlorophyll, it doesn't have any way of providing its own food. <coughs> it's growing in a relationship with some little underground truffle fungi. Not culinary truffles, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Little, you know, mushrooms that root underground and are growing with primarily fir trees in their neighborhoods. Sometimes also with fungi that are growing with pine. These are two orchids which never grow out of the getting their food from the fungi thing. These orchids don't have any chlorophyll at any time of their life. And we see both of these pretty frequently in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, Rhiza, the coral root orchids, are not the only orchids that maintain getting their nutrition through fungi, but they are the most striking because they have no other way of obtaining food. If you think about maybe rattlesnake plantain, that's another orchid in the same family that's green, it's got chlorophyll, but it's in the understory of the forest. And you see this as a strategy a lot with understory shrubs and understory herbaceous plants in deep forest. They are kind of mooching off of the tree canopy via the fungal partners that are going between them <coughs> in, the back, in the way that they, they can't produce enough of their own sugars because they don't have enough sunlight. Two more, maybe familiar ones, pine drops, and this is the wintergreen. These are back in the Ericaceae, the Heather family. And you'll notice that this wintergreen doesn't have any leaves. It's the only species of wintergreen which consistently doesn't have any leaves in California. Um, but it's still got chlorophyll, it's still green. So it can produce its own food a little bit. But it doesn't have very much surface area to do that. So this is kind of 
it will take advantage of sunlight when it can get it, but it's mostly feeding on its fungal partner and thereby on plants. So I know you probably wanted to see pictures of mushrooms, and that's what I'll go to next. I just had to share a picture of where I was last July. This is right at the Pacific Crest Trail of the Southern Sierras. Again, very rocky, decomposed granite soil. Not a lot going on, but there are these foxtail pines, which are surviving and thriving there. And they indeed have mycorrhizal partners, and I found one, which we'll see next. It's not super impressive, but this is what I mean by a truffle. That's the outside of it, and that's cut to show the inside, or broken to show the inside. So this is a strategy that mostly active mycorrhizal fungi will use. Also, some decomposer fungi, which are related to the active mycorrhizal fungi, use the same strategy. But this is much more common among active mycorrhizal fungi. So it's just completely underground, and most of these develop strong odors um, at maturity. And small mammals will be attracted to them, will eat them, will digest their spores, hopefully move somewhere else without the spores, and then you have the potential for new individuals. So that's how troubles reproduction works. Gone. We're going to have something more spectacular to most eyes, probably. The fly agaric, and the muscaria group. That was a watchful pine up in the same area as the foxtail pines, just a little bit lower on the slope, a little bit more on water. And um, again, this is just the fruiting body. We can't see anything of what the fungus is actually doing with the tree roots. We can just see evidence of it in both the mushrooms and the healthy trees around. More fly bears. They're too pretty. I can't get away from them. <laughs> but I'll say that this is not the same species as that cause a species group like so many things in fungi. Probably are familiar with some of that from plants, but it's not nearly to the same degree as we have that in fungi. So this is growing with valley oak. This is actually in the Casunas River Preserve. So Central Valley, very different environment than the High Sierra Lodgepole Pine. Here's another Amanita, uh, different from the fly agaric. This is the Cochera, which so many Italian Americans love as an edible. Um, you can probably tell by the litter. This is local to, I think this was at Bullard Bar probably, certainly in the matter of Yuba County. Tan oak leaves. Ponderosa pine. There's a Doug fir cone down here, I think it's covered up. There's a little tan oak seedling. And these are growing in mixed woods, and this is probably an example, like so many other ectomycorrhizal fungi, of something that's got multiple tree hosts. It's probably on the tan oak, it's probably on the duck fir, possibly also on the ponderosa pine. Um, we know that we only see this mushroom in the Sierra Nevada where there is plentiful tan oak and duck fir. So that gives some indication of probably what the required host is. is but that doesn't mean that other trees can't be part of that network, too. So, this is actually a habitat in which I do a lot of my summer botany work. Meadows, meadow edges, and usually lodgepole pine, sometimes some other conifer trees around the edges. It's a great place to look for mushrooms in the summertime because the meadows hold a lot of moisture. And so even if there hasn't been recent rain, you can often find ectomycorrhizal fungi fruiting right around the edge of the meadow where they're still in the zone of the roots of the lodgepole pines but are getting the extra moisture from the meadow. So so where was that? That is actually on the Sierra National Forest, so to stop the Yosemite. Yeah. This is not from California, and I was hesitant to put this in there, but it's so pretty. <laughs> this is a species of chanterelle that we do not get in California. We get a relative of it in the Chanterella cerisea canis group. But this is growing with lodgepole pine and spruce, England spruce, in Idaho. And I do like eating mushrooms as well as studying them. I can say that these chanterelles 
are a lot fruitier and a lot more flavorful than champagnes that we grow have here in California. <laughs> uh, this is probably a good time to say like why if you haven't already gathered. Why chanterelles? Why porcini? Why matsutake? Why all of these prized mushrooms are so expensive? Because you can't grow them without their tree partners. And it's really impractical in most cases for people to plant a nursery with trees that are inoculated with the correct fungus and then wait for that nursery to produce maybe someday. So the market for these mushrooms is entirely supplied by people going out into the woods and picking them and selling them to usually a middleman and then to another middleman and then eventually gets to your restaurant or your market. So, yeah. And now for something that you wouldn't want to eat. This is from Yuba Pass um, in August. So one thing I like to make sure I always point out is we have all of our mushroom events in the winter around here, but mushrooming is a year-round activity in California. Never, ever stop looking for mushrooms. <laughs> you can go from the highest peaks of the Sierras all summer long and into the fall, and then the coastal mountains start picking up, and as the rains start, things move down to lower elevations to the foothills, and then in the dead of winter to the valley floor, and then there's another spring flush in the valley and foothills, and then it moves gradually up the slope, and you get springtime species, like the snowmelt pink waxy cap that I showed you, and morels, and then you end up back at the crest for the summer season again. So this is, again, an ectomycorrhizal species, in this case with red fur. Um, it's a brucella, and if you're familiar with mushrooms at all, you know that these have really brittle flesh, and that is one of the ways you identify them, by throwing them at something, or somebody, or <laughs> snapping them in half, because you get a really clean break, unlike most mushrooms, which will have some fibrous context, at least in the stalk. But yeah, these are brittle. This particular one is stains red and then black. Um, and there's a whole group of them that do that. And I can't put the species name on this. Nobody can. It's probably undescribed, which is the case with so many fungi. Our knowledge base um, when it comes to fungi, whether ectomycorrhizal or decomposer, or one of these groups that forms our vascular mycorrhizae, it doesn't matter. We have very, very little knowledge of what's actually out there. Um, there are estimates that of ectomycorrhizal species alone that range from 25,000, 50,000 species out there. We don't really know. Most of them are still waiting to be described. So there's a lot of work for mycologists out there in years to come. Here's one, another popular edible. It's our spring king, Boletus uh, rex veris. So, unlike Drusilla, unlike the chanterelles, it's got this, you know, sponge layer, pore layer. And uh, there are many different species of Boletus out there. This is one of the groups that forms the porcini clay that's so beloved in many cuisines around the world. So, with white fur, this was actually in the El Dorado National Forest just in May. So these things are around if you have the right tree hosts and the right conditions and moisture in the spring. That'll come up. <laughs> I had to include this one. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so yes, I like large and edible and pretty and all the mushrooms. But then there are those little fit on a tiny and they're really cute. <laughs> this is another species that probably doesn't have a name. Uh, fits into the Helvella dryophila group, which are elfin saddles, um, somewhat related to morels. But yeah, these were uh, in Placer County along, along the American River, and it was, I was really blown away by seeing them there because of the lack of hosts, lack of possible tree hosts. Okay, so the only things that were even anywhere close were white leaf manzanita interior live oak and chemise. 
Shanice is not in one of the plant families that has ectomycorrhizae. It has our vascular mycorrhizae instead. So you wouldn't ever expect to see a fleshy mushroom growing with Shanice. But these are growing right under a Shanice bush. Go figure <laughs> But they were probably like with either the manzanita or the live oak, which were at a respectable distance from them. And another habitat shot, Table Mountain. It's a beautiful place to go through the flowers. But if you drop down beyond the first waterfall and get down and take some hikes around, this is really interesting forest in here. There's a really good mix of oaks. There's madrone in there, which is pretty low elevation spot for madrone. Um, buckeye, which is again not ectomycorrhizal or vascular mycorrhizal, but just a really neat mix of trees and then abundant water in winter time because it's all on the salt, so the water comes up on top, and that's why the top is so good for flowers too. I did find this on Table Mountain, and I've also seen it several places since then. It's another elfin saddle, like little black ones, but this is a more reasonable size. And with interior live oak, usually found in pretty deep litter. But I just love these because they're so beautiful. So. That's about all I had, but I know that you'll probably have questions, and I could spend a lot more time talking about almost any of these topics. So I definitely want to thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.